Uh, so we, as he mentioned, I'm Doug Ledford. I'm from Red Hat. Um, this talk is primarily about uh, the interaction we have at Red Hat and the Open Fabrics Software Alliance. Um, I'm going to cover a few things today, uh, fairly simple stuff. So I'm going to go over what kind of software we actually use from the OFA. And I bring this up because a lot of people associate the OFA with OFID when it comes to the software stack. And um, OFID does not actually play into what we do at Red Hat. Um, but I've been asked to speak about the upstream first policy, which is actually something that's very important to Red Hat. And so I do have several things to say on that. Then I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how we actually do our updates on point updates. Some people may not be aware exactly how we plan these out, what our logistics are. And then finally, I, I oftentimes get the question, um, we need OFID 3.12 in order to make this work. Will your software work out of the box? That kind of thing. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the comparison between OFID version numbers and Red Hat version numbers and how to tell when our product is going to work for you without having to necessarily go to OFID. So there's a little bit of history behind all of this. We used to ship OFID in our Red Hat products. And um, we started working with the Open Fabric Alliance all the way back in the days of Red Hat Enterprise Linux 3. And so that's, that's so long ago. That's ancient, ancient stuff. And we were there when OFID first came around. And we started shipping OFID, and we shipped OFID in Red Hat Enterprise Linux 4 and in Red Hat Enterprise Linux 5. Red Hat Enterprise Linux 5 was the last distribution where we shipped OFID. Starting with Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6, we pull everything directly from upstream. So I get all of my source code for the kernel directly from Linux's kernel tree. This happens to be in lockstep now with the way OFID is doing its work in that the OFID 3.12 package is based upon Linux's upstream 3.12 kernel and then select bug fixes. In the event that I pull from, say, a 3.12 kernel, I'm likely to pull select bug fixes too. So in that sense, we're very comparable. Um, so when you compare OFID 3.12 to Red Hat Enterprise Linux, then uh, you need to know what kernel I have pulled from for any given point release. So one of the things we do with our product, now that we pull directly from upstream, is we have a, a standard operating system always provides a strong guarantee of ABI throughout the life of the operating system. This is true across the board, uh, Windows, Linux, everything. If you build your software to work with a version of an operating system, it always works with the ongoing point releases with very, very few exceptions. And we follow that inside of Red Hat for our product across the board. What we do, however, though, is we make an exemption for the entire RDMA stack. We try to keep the ABI and the API uh, solid and stable from 6.0 through 6. whatever the end is. But we can't always do that. Um, and that's primarily because of Open MPI and Open SM. Uh, for the most part, though, we do keep to that. But because the rest of the operating system does follow that and provides a very hard guarantee, we're able to keep a nice, steady, reliable base platform and then build a up-to-date RDMA platform on top of it. So in most cases, I don't think you'll actually see much difference between OFID and our product because of the fact that we stay as up-to-date as we do. Uh, when Woody had his slides up yesterday and he was talking about the OFID distribution 3.12 and then 3.12-1, when you looked at the lower portion of the slides, there was different package names and different package numbers, like librdmacm-1.0.18 uh, was in 3.12, and then 1.0.19.1 was in 3.12-1. Uh, well, it turns out we have very similar librdmacm versions in our product. The only difference really between us is that I don't pull the exact same set that OFID does. So the upstream acceptance requirement for us is extremely important. Um, that was something that we fought for back in the day and really, really pushed 
uh, the EWG on very, very hard to do. There was, um, most of you have probably watched TLC and Discovery at some point in time, and you've seen those um, occasional shows that come on that you watch because it's the engineering disasters and you get to watch the train wrecks and, and go, thank God that wasn't me. We kind of had our own engineering disaster back in the day, and it was what taught us that we really need to be upstream first. Uh, we had some binary incompatible products out in the wild that were out for a period of a couple of years. And so that presented a problem. And nowadays, due to the uh, advanced tooling that upstream has, and, and in this particular case, I'm talking about Git and the uh, efficiencies of workflow and efficiencies of distribution that Git brings to kernel development. Um, inside Red Hat, we really have scaled up our internal development. And so the upstream requirement is even more important to us now than it ever has been before. A, a single point release can have 10,000 plus patches. And in a single point release of our kernel, I have personally pushed in as many as seven to 800 patches into the kernel. Uh, and Red Hat's a kernel. So without that tooling, we wouldn't be able to get that done. And that tooling goes hand in hand with the upstream first. And if we didn't do the upstream first, it would still have to be in Git somewhere because you just can't do that manually with patches anymore. You can't handle that kind of flow. And so even if it were outside the kernel and in a Git repo, then you still have to worry about the, the same problem we had before, which was um, API and ABI flap. Do you know, if you put stuff in before it goes upstream, is the API or the ABI going to change by the time it lands upstream? And that can be a real problem. So the upstream acceptance for the kernel is paramount for us. For user space, uh, we've got pretty much the exact same thing. Uh, the difference is the upstream for user space is not Linux. You know, it's somewhere else. In many cases, the upstream for user space uh, could be somebody in this room, as I look for Sean to see if he's still around here somewhere today. Um, and so it's much easier to get things into the upstream for user space, and it's much easier to have a stable API and a stable ABI uh, because we don't have the same level of overhead for the user space packages. This does bring up one notable exception uh, in the form of libib verbs, where we're having a problem at the moment getting things into the upstream for user space. Um, and so this is something that I think is going to have to be addressed. And I, I'm not going to address that here today other than to say that it needs to be addressed. And I know that people have uh, discussed that in this room and we need to move forward on that. But uh, the user space upstream is uh, also tied to the kernel space tightly enough that we have the same types of requirements here in terms of API flap and weeding out questionable solutions for the, the upstream first requirement. So inside Red Hat Linux, when I do a point release, starting from the general release product, the .0 product, up all the way through the .6 to .7 product, somewhere in that life, life cycle, Every point release is a full refresh of the RDMA stack. So OFID tends to release about every six months. Um, our current cadence for point releases inside of a product is somewhere around every nine months. And we do a full refresh then every nine months. So we don't quite match OFID as far as what they do because we'll pick up a little bit more new stuff, but then it'll be a slightly longer window before we do it again. Um, However, around the six or seven release, we scale that back drastically. And so, for example, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6.6 .6 was the last one we released with a full point release. 6.7 is in development, and 6.7 is not getting a full refresh at all. And we are now tapering down the 6.7 RDMA updates. It's being uh, put into a mode where it can be deployed long term as is, but if you need new features, you have to move up to the next release. And that's the standard path that we like to follow on this. Um, and that's usually because by the time we get to the .6 or .7 release, we're around the .2 or .3 release of the next major version. And by the time you've gotten that far in, we've 
really want people looking to the next major version for new features. And uh, by the time you get to the dot six or dot seven release, those same new features, if you try to bring them back, a lot of times start become destabilizing uh, to the overall kernel. You're talking about kernel infrastructure missing, um, things you have to work around and that kind of stuff. So your back port load goes way up, your risk goes way up, and it's not really worth the payback. So that does bring up the, the issue of how do you figure out you know, how we compare to OFID in terms of releases. Um, with RHEL 5 and earlier, I actually had a package in the distribution called OpenIB, because this was back before we had OFID. And the OpenIB package version number was the OFID that was included in the product. Starting with RHEL 6, I added the RDMA package, which is a Red Hat specific package, and it contains nothing but Red Hat's initialization scripts, configuration files, and stuff like that that we use to bring OFID up on our systems. Or not OFID, but bring up the InfiniBand stack. Um, in the beginning of RHEL 6, I just called the RDMA package RDMA 1.0, which turns out to be totally unhelpful. And around 6.4 or so, when I was having a hard time myself remembering what kernel version was the one that I used in the last point release so I can start my next point release, I realized that I was going to have to do something different. So the uh, RDMA package got a new form, which at least told me the kernel version that was included in that particular release. Turns out that that wasn't sufficient either, because then I had to worry about somebody upgrading from Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6 to Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7, and what if it just so happened that the RDMA package version on 6 was newer than the one on 7? You wouldn't get the upgrade, and the configuration files would all be wrong and everything else. So we went to the final form, which is the major minor point release underscore the kernel version that I pulled that code from. And so for Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6.6, .6, I did in fact pull from the 3.15 kernel. Um, and using that form, I was going, or I was able to go back and look up a, a few items that uh, had escaped my memory. So when Woody was talking yesterday about the OFID 3.12 release, and he's saying that he thought that was pretty close to Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7.0, he was right in that 7.0 shipped with 3.13 RC8 as the RDMA stack, and then 7.1 shipped with a 3.18 RDMA stack. 6.6 got 3.15, and so as you can see, what point release I pull from depends on where in the upstream cycle upstream is when I'm doing the updates. But that generally speaking covers how Red Hat uses the RDMA stack, and uh, I know that in the past we've stopped using OFID, and after listening to Woody talk yesterday, it, it becomes apparent to me that if I wanted to, or if there was call for it, um, OFID is probably an acceptable delivery vehicle again now that the upstream first policy is in place. But then that left me with the question, would that actually be helpful? And that was one of the reasons I pulled out those version numbers. Um, I actually think that at this point, with the way Red Hat does things, we can actually keep more up to date with upstream than we could if we followed OFID. And so I don't know that it would necessarily be helpful to do that. Although I, I will admit the, uh, the specter of additional testing and especially multi-vendor testing is kind of appealing. And so you never know, there's possibility that we might revisit that decision. But that's all I had. Any questions? <laughs>